This morning, I want to speak to you from the book of Acts again. If you want to look over there, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 51 is where we'll begin. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. I begin reading there. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of resisting the Holy Spirit. And so I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that God wants to communicate with us and God wants to get our attention. God's got things for us to do and he wants to share that with us. And he wants to get our attention and speak to us. And the main way he does that is in the inner man through the Spirit. But sometimes what happens, I, I, I'm assuming that you're like I am, sometimes I resist what God wants me to do. And in a minute, we're going to look at why we do that. But I was reading this week about this park ranger uh, who was a tour guide out in one of the parks out west. And he was uh, involved in his, uh, in his tour. He was pointing out flowers and little bugs. And, you know, he's just all into the, uh, the, the whole surroundings. And the whole time he's doing that, his walkie-talkie keeps squeeching and squelching, you know, and, and, and being a real distraction. And because it was bothering him in some of his lectures that he was giving, he just reached down and turned it off. And he went on about the tour. And next thing you know, uh, a, a, a helicopter comes up and lands on the pathway. And these guys get out, look like they're dressed with SWAT stuff on and everything. And they come rushing up to him. And he stands there. The whole team freezes. What's going on? They said, didn't you know we was trying to get in touch with you? He said, yeah, but it was bothering me, so I turned it off. Turns out they were being stalked by a grizzly bear. And they were trying to get in touch with them so they could get to safety. But because the voice was annoying, he turned it off. Now, husbands never do that to your wives, all right? And none of us ought ever do that to God. But do you know, anytime we tune out the Holy Spirit, anytime we ignore the warnings of the Bible, we put ourselves and other people around us in danger. Sometimes we sense the Holy Spirit prompting us to do something. Sometimes we, we know the Lord wants us to do something. Maybe, maybe uh, we start wandering towards something that's harmful. Maybe we're wandering towards sin and we're looking towards sin and the Holy Spirit begins to convict our hearts about that. Stay away from that. Don't do that. Get away from that. And because we don't want to do what the Holy Spirit tells us, we begin to resist. Instead of repenting and seeking God's grace, we resist. Sometimes God calls us to a sacrificial ministry. Now, uh, the first reaction that most of us have when God wants us to sacrifice something is, God, I'm not doing that. I can't give that up. And what we do is we resist the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to preach on that subject, resisting the Holy Spirit. Here's the central truth. 
The central truth of this message is it is wise to submit to the Holy Spirit. It's wise. It's wise to submit to the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to point out two or three things, and I know it's hot, and uh, I know some of y'all just get the jitters being in school anyway. So uh, we're going to rush on through this, all right? Let me give you the context of this. This is a message. This is a sermon that Stephen preached after having been accused of blasphemy. The Jewish leaders, uh, they don't like Stephen because he's telling them they crucified Jesus and, and so forth and so on. So they haul him before the Sanhedrin where he makes a vigorous verbal defense. We talked about that last week about defending the gospel. And in the sermon that I didn't read to you because it's rather lengthy, but the point is Stephen gets straight to their heart. He goes right at them in the sermon. Let me just summarize it for you. Uh, he starts off in chapter 7, verse 2. He says, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to Abraham. That phrase, the God of glory, was only used in one other passage in the Psalms. And it was a psalm about the majesty, the sovereignty, and the glory of God. And the reason Stephen started that way is because he's been accused of blasphemy. He wants them to know right up front, I have not blasphemed God, I revere God. And then he launches into his sermon. And in verse 9, Stephen begins with Joseph. And he shows them how that they have always resisted God. He says the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph. And they sold him into Egypt. Then he goes on down and he starts with Moses. And in verse 27, he says, uh, the people said, who made, talking about Moses, who made you ruler and judge over us? So in other words, they're not following Moses. Then in verse 35, it says, the people said, this Moses uh, whom they disowned. In other words, they disowned Moses. And then in verse 39, it says, Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. Stephen is starting to weave a tapestry through this sermon to point out to them that not only have they resisted the Holy Spirit, but they've also rebelled against their leader, Moses. They did not follow Moses. They did not follow Joseph. And then Stephen uh, goes on to point out how that in the wilderness they built a golden calf and they worshiped idols until they were taken away uh, into Babylon. And then he says, Solomon built you a magnificent temple, but the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. And uh, so Stephen is basically telling them, you know, you guys, you, you guys are so big on your traditions, you're so big on your heritage, and you're so big on the law of Moses, and yet... In our history, we never have kept the law of Moses. And boy, I tell you what, when he gets to that point, it's like he gives them a haymaker. He, he, he blasts them. And the final straw that made them so upset was when he said, when he said, verse 53, you received the law as ordained by angels, yet you did not keep it. And he says, you, God keeps sending you people after people after people. And the ultimate voice, the righteous one, you have murdered. Boy, when, when, when Stephen said you murdered God's final prophet and you have not obeyed Moses and you did not keep the law, that was more than they could bear. They drug him outside the city and they stoned him to death. They resisted the Holy Spirit. And it's always wise to submit to and surrender to the Holy Spirit. So let's look at that. Why do we resist the Holy Spirit? Why do we resist the Holy Spirit? Let me give you two or three reasons. One reason people resist the Holy Spirit is because of spiritual darkness and spiritual immaturity. Spiritual darkness and or spiritual immaturity. Now, uh, uh, some people uh, 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 come to Christ and yet uh, they haven't grown enough to know how to follow the Lord and walk in the Spirit. But some people resist the Holy Spirit because they're not saved. Uh, our default, our default of the natural man is to resist the calling of the Holy Spirit. If that were not true, if it were not true that the, that the natural man resists the Holy Spirit, do you know what? If that weren't true, 
this place would be so packed they'd be standing in the road to get in here this morning. I, I'm here to tell you, they were, we couldn't build the churches big enough to pack the people in if it weren't for the fact that people are desperately in spiritual darkness and the heart of man is desperately wicked. And so we need to be converted. The Apostle Paul said you were formerly in darkness. Jesus said that judgment, uh, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so uh, if you've yet to repent and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior this morning and, 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 and you've not come to Christ, here's what, here's what I know. For people who've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, here's what I know. When we give an invitation in just a few moments, when I ask people, would you like to receive Christ as your Savior, right where you stand, you can receive Jesus Christ. But you know what? There's like a magnet. There's like a magnet that's holding you in place. It's, it's like a spiritual magnet. You say, I want to go, but I ain't going. I, I need to go, but I'm not going. I, I know I need to trust Jesus Christ. I know I need to bow my knee, but you know what? I can't do it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it next week. You start making excuses. Or you start telling yourself, well, I'm not all that bad. That's darkness. That's resisting the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes we resist the Holy Spirit because we're not been saved. And then sometimes Christians, people who are saved, resist the Holy Spirit because, as I said, they've not learned to walk in the Spirit. The Corinthians are prime examples of that. There's two books in the Bible written to these people. These people definitely know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but to men as of flesh, infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you're not yet able to receive it. Listen to this. Indeed, even now you're still not able. Paul says, even today, now that you're saved, even though you've been a Christian for some time, you're not able to receive the spiritual leadership of God because, he says, you're fleshly. That is, you're living like people who are not saved. Why? Because they had not grown enough yet. They had not matured enough in their spiritual walk. They had not walked with God long enough to know how to follow and walk with the Spirit. And so the Corinthians uh, were experiencing strife. Listen to what he says. There's jealousy and strife among you. You're, you're fleshly and you're acting like natural men. And so sometimes as Christian people, as Christian people, we fail to grow for whatever reason. Maybe we, 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 we don't read the Bible. Maybe we stop worshiping. Maybe we stop going to Bible study. Maybe we just don't know we're supposed to. I don't know, but you can dwarf your spiritual life by living uh, as, as an unsaved person, even as a Christian. And so uh, when you hear the word of God preached and you hear somebody and you're living in that mode, you resist. I don't, I don't really want to do that. That Bible study is not for me. I don't want to go to church today. And so uh, what happens is you begin to resist what God wants to do in your life. There's a second reason. We resist because of darkness and spiritual immaturity, but also because of sin. The scripture teaches us that the spirit of God indwells the Spirit of God, if you're saved this morning, the Spirit of Almighty God lives within you. God's Spirit, the same Spirit that spoke the universe into existence, indwells you. So, the Bible says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. The indwelling Holy Spirit desires to lead and to guide his children to do certain things. That spirit, God Almighty, the, the creator of the universe, lives in you and he desires, he testifies. The, the, the text says, the spirit of the living God dwells in you and he testifies to you. Why? Because he wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. He wants to prompt you to do certain things and to live certain ways. The indwelling Spirit of God uh, desires to guide the children of God. And, the, and, 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 and sin, what happens is when we, when we choose to sin and we choose to, to, to ignore the voice of God and to walk in sin, 
What we do is, is we choose something other than God's best. And we choose something that's wrong and harmful. But the problem is, this sin thing over here, we enjoy. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a certain temporary pleasure in a lot of sin. A lot of sins have an initial payoff, you know, but it's kind of like eating sugar. If all you ever ate was sugar, after a while, I mean, it tastes great, right? But after a while, you're going to be anemic. You're going to be sick. I don't know what's going to happen. You're going to get diabetes and die because why? Because you can't live on sugar. It's a temporary high. It's a temporary rush that you get from it. And the more of it you eat, the more of it you have to eat. That's sin. That's sin. And sin is, is sin, the Bible says, when sin lust is conceived, it produces sin, and then sin brings forth death. And we know that, and uh, sin tugs at us, the Spirit leads us, but sin tugs us the other way. And what we do is we begin to think about sin. We begin to think about a sin that we want to commit. We begin to think about an activity that we know that's wrong. We know God does not want us to do this. We know it's wrong, and yet we start thinking about it. We start imagining it. We start dwelling on it. We start fantasizing about it. The next thing you know, the next thing you know, we want to take a nibble. Just going to try a little bit. Just want to see what it's like. Just want to touch it. Just want to feel it. Just got to experience it one time. That's all. Then I can say I did it and I'm done. But hey, guess what? You can't do that because now what's happened is, is you've shut off the Holy Spirit. You've closed down the voice of God. And now you're focused totally on that thing that God does not want you to have. And you know what? When you're in the ravages of sin, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to really listen to God's voice because you're focused in the negative direction. You've got to turn away from that sin and look to Jesus if you're going to follow the Lord. And so now what's happened is because we've got sin in our life, we face a choice. We can either submit and repent and walk in power or we can say, I don't want to do that right now. I want to play with this sin. I want to hold on to it. I want it to be my friend. And so because we like our sin, we resist the Holy Spirit. Notice what Stephen called these people. He said they were stiff-necked and uncircumcised at heart. Now, a stiff neck is the image of an ox. <laughs> an ox. I, don't, I, I wouldn't call y'all oxes or anything such as that, but Stephen did. Maybe that's what got him killed. But uh, uh, the, the idea of a stiff neck is an ox was used to do two, two basic things, to plow and to pull the carts. Pull carts around. That was their that was their Ford trucks back then. And so, uh, the way you guided uh, the way the way to guide an ox was the driver had a long stick that was a lot of times they would put steel in the end of it or maybe they would just sharpen it. But that long stick was long enough. And if they wanted the ox to speed up to go faster, they gouged him around his ankles. Can you imagine how that hurts? They gouge him like, I'm not moonwalking again. And they'd gouge him and, uh, and he'd go a little faster. If they wanted that ox to turn to the right, they gouged him on the, on the left side of the neck, made him turn his head, he'd go that way. And it's the same way the other way. A stiff-necked ox was one who's made up his mind, I ain't doing it. I'm not turning. And so when the, when the driver wants him to turn, turn right, he gouges him with that stick and he says, I ain't doing it. And he stiffens his neck and raises his head and keeps going the way he wants to go. That's what a picture of somebody who is resisting the Holy Spirit. Later on, this Saul who sees this, when God strikes him down on the Damascus road, you know what he says to him? He said, Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. He looks right back to this picture. Saw you resisted the Holy Spirit. And so what happens is, is we sin and uh, uh, we, 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 we don't want to turn loose of it. We are enjoying it for some reason. It's got a hold on us. And uh, uh, God's convicting us and God's trying to get us to turn back. And he's gouging us with his stick. He's pricking us in our heart. He's trying to get us to move, but we've stiffened our neck. We bowed up. We're not going to change. And sometimes what happens is our sin causes us to resist the Holy Spirit. There's one other reason, and that is pride. Pride causes us to resist the Holy Spirit. Stephen, uh, in this sermon, he goes over there, the, the history of the Jewish people. And he highlights a nation 
that continually walked in religious pride. He chronicles how they refused to follow Moses. He talks about them persecuting the prophets. He said, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and kill? And not only that, y'all gone so far as to kill Jesus. Now, they didn't see their history that way. The Jews saw their history as one of being glorious and magnificent. They wanted to, they wanted to cherry pick all the, all the good things and dwell on them and ignore all the bad things. Isn't that the way we are? They saw a history of glory and wonder and spiritual blessing by God. But Stephen, he recounts a history of them continuously resisting and rebelling against God. And without a doubt, Stephen's history lesson insulted their religious pride. And they didn't, want to, they didn't want to surrender. Now, none of us, none of us likes to be called a sinner. I was thinking about this today as I was driving back from here over to the church. There used to be a song we used to sing, and it was called, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. And the second song, the verse said, Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I. That's the original, but we've changed that for some reason, and now they've made it for a sinner such as I. Hey, I'd rather be a worm than a sinner. <laughs> I mean, a worm is just an animal. A sinner is a sinner before God. I don't know why they changed that. But uh, nonetheless, religious pride makes it difficult for us to repent. Religious pride makes it difficult for us to repent. None of us likes to be called a sinner. So often when we say, uh, we, we say God loves you, but he wants you to repent and he wants you to change. But when we hear that, we say, why don't God just love me like I am? Well, God does love you like you are. God never stopped loving you. You've never done one thing that made God not love you. But God does not necessarily always approve of all of our behavior because it brings disrespect to Him and it destroys us. And so, uh, uh, I, nobody likes me called. I remember talking to this woman one time on the phone. I called her up and we were having a conversation and we were talking about an issue. Uh, this woman owned a, a movie store and I was trying to get her to take a picture down off the front of the store. It was nasty. And uh, so I called her. We were having a conversation, and she knew I was pastor of the Baptist church, and, and, and we're just going along in this conversation, and all of a sudden she blurts out. She said, but I'm a good person, and none of my kids use drugs. <laughs> and I thought, wow, <laughs> who brought that up? You know, what happened was, is we were talking about God and righteousness and Jesus, she didn't want to admit she's a sinner, so she started telling me good things about herself. Because we resist when the Holy Spirit convicts us. There's some of you sitting here this morning, you may need to repent of something in your life. There may be an outstanding sin, an ongoing sin, a regular habitual thing that's in your life, and God has put his finger on it, and you know what it is, and while I'm speaking right now, you know it, and you have been resisting. Because you're just too proud to admit you've been wrong. Now that's why we resist. I want you to see two or three things about what happens when you resist. And that is the results of resisting the Holy Spirit. The first thing is, is they rebelled against the message and the messenger. The message and the messenger. Now, the Jews in those days rejected Stephen's message outright. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to hear about uh, salvation by grace through faith, through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it wasn't enough for them to just ignore his message. They had to vent their anger and carry out their frustrations against the messenger. You ever notice that? You don't like the message, so you kill the messenger? That's exactly what they did. One of the favorite tactics of the devil is to attack the messenger. Often the word of God pricks our hearts. The word of God, the Bible says, is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. 
It cuts our pride. It exposes our sin. It calls us to repent. And it tells us to change. And sometimes when we refuse the word of God, instead of repenting, we just take out our frustrations on the messenger. Y'all seen this? Resistant people act differently depending upon their personality. Now, some people are passively resistant. You can preach to them all day long and it don't bother them. They don't repent. They don't do anything. They go, hmm. You know, the, the Baptist amen. Hmm. <laughs> but, but, and, and so they, 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 don't, they don't take it out on the messenger. That is so long as you leave them in their comfort zone. And here's what happens. When the Holy Spirit begins to prick, to gouge, to point out, to cause us to be uncomfortable, we got to move. We got to do something. Cindy just got back from Arkansas. She's been out there with her dad. Her dad's a clown. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. 96 years old. Several years ago, we went, on a, we went on a trip with them. And we were, I don't remember if we were in Arkansas or Missouri or somewhere. But we went to a zoo. And... Uh, uh, we, it was a hot day. It was like this time of year. And we were looking at all the animals. They had this big cage up there. And uh, they had this gorilla in this cage. This gorilla in this big old cage. And we all walked by that gorilla and looked in there. And it was so hot. The old gorilla, he was just laid back there. had his hand like that. He was, just, he was just laying there. Just right up against the cage, you know. And I threw a pebble or two at him. I wanted him to get up. I wanted to see how big he was. He didn't move. He wasn't the he wasn't least bit interested. So I said, well, I'll just leave that girl alone. And so I went away. And so we're, we're off looking at maybe some, I don't know, some goats or something. And all of a sudden we hear this racket over there. It sounded like the second coming of the Lord. I mean, it was terrible over there. And, and, and we went over there. That monkey, he had done lost it. He was grabbing the bars and shaking them and spit was flying every which way. And he was squawking and carrying on. And Earl was just standing there laughing. Earl, what did you do? He said, well, I wanted to see that monkey. So he had a Dr. Pepper. And he shook it up like that, and then he spewed the monkey. And suddenly, suddenly that passive gorilla got uncomfortable and came unglued. Now, you know what? That's the way I've seen people in church. I have seen people act that way in church. Sat passively by, sat passively by. People preach everything under the sun. And, on the, and somehow or another, the Holy Spirit get a hold of them. And instead of them repenting and turning to Christ, they just get mad. They get ugly. They act awful. They yell. They scream. I've seen this. Have you seen this? I have seen people, once they get disturbed and they don't want to repent, they want to either Reject the message and kill the messenger. The second thing is, when we resist the Holy Spirit, it grieves the Spirit of God. Now, the theme of Stephen's sermon is that these Jewish people had frequently and continuously rebelled and grieved the Spirit of God. Isaiah 63, 9 says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. In other words, he's talking about when God took them out of Egypt and took them through the promised land. But they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. All the time through the world. For 40 years, they grieved the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, Paul writes to us, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The word grieve means to cause hurt. It means to make sorrowful. It means to cause somebody to feel uneasy. When we resist the Holy Spirit, we grieve the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God intended for the children of Israel to enter to conquer the land of Canaan, and as his ambassadors, as the army of the Lord, they were to conquer through his power, occupy through his power, and rule as a kingdom of priests in the promised land. But the psalmist said how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. In unbelief, they resisted the Holy Spirit, rebelled in the promised land. And so God finally sent them off into Babylon where they lived for 70 years. Here's the point. 
When we resist the Holy Spirit to the point of disobedience, what we do is, is we put ourselves in a, a spiritual position where we miss God's best for our life. Grieving. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? He's the, he's the driver. He's the guy with the stick trying to get us to go this way or that way. To stiffen our necks and to refuse to go where God's Spirit is leading us is to miss God's best. Oh, if we could just see that. How many saved people, how many saved people are living spiritual life of aimlessness? No purpose. No goal. Just survival. Wandering without God's purpose, missing God's best because in their hearts, they're either hanging on to some sin they love or going in some way that their flesh wants to lead them. And the question is, how can we expect to be blessed and empowered and succeed in life all the while grieving the Spirit of God? You see, you can't. You can't. And if we're truly saved, we cannot be happy in this world while at the same time grieving God's Spirit. There's a third thing that happens. If we continue to resist the Holy Spirit, now are you listening? If you're listening, say amen. amen. All right, now listen to me. If you continuously live in, in rebellion and resistance toward the Spirit of God, you can refuse to listen to till you get to the point that you can no longer hear. You can, you can just shut out the voice of God until you, you, you lose any ability to hear. You say, well, where does that say that in the Bible? Listen to this. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 13, verse 14. Jesus is telling a parable there about listening. He's talking about listening to the Word of God specifically, but in the middle of that, He says this. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. Now, here's the prophecy. You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and their ears they scarcely hear. Their eyes are closed. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because you see and your ears because you hear. In other words, resisting the Holy Spirit had become such a way of life that now with the Son of God standing in their midst, teaching them the Word of God in the power of the Spirit, they have no capacity to receive or perceive what it is God wants from their life. They had closed their heart to the voice of God by Resisting. The prophet Jeremiah delivered God's message, but the people paid no attention. They refused to listen. Listen to what Jeremiah said to them in Jeremiah 6.10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. They had refused to listen until they lost the ability to hear. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them and they have no delight in it. It's always wise to submit to the Holy Spirit. It's always wise to submit to the Holy Spirit, and it's dangerous for us to ignore the Spirit of God. There's a sin in the Bible Jesus talks about called the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin. It's listed in, in three of the Gospels. Mark's Gospel uh, talks about the unpardonable sin in Mark chapter 3. And in that passage, Jesus, here's what's happening. Jesus is actually performing, now understand this, signs, signs. Signs were messianic miracles validating the Son of God. That's what signs were. For example, one of the sign gifts of, 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 of the Messiah was he would make blind eyes to see. Do you know nobody in the scripture made anybody, healed anybody of blindness except Jesus? And so uh, they were witnessing Jesus do miracles, sign miracles, proving that he was the Son of God, and he was performing these by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, these people see this. They see it, and they know what's going on. But instead of 
instead of following the Holy Spirit, instead of submitting to the Holy Spirit, instead of surrendering their will to the Lord Jesus and becoming saved, you know what they did instead? They said, you know, you know what spirit's working in him? The spirit of Beelzebub. Now, I don't know, you ought to study this Beelzebub character. Otherwise known as the Lord of the Flies. Flies congregate on garbage and manure. To be Lord of the Flies makes you king of garbage. That's what they were telling Jesus. Right in, the, right, in the, right in the presence of the Holy Spirit doing sign miracles. No, I don't. He's not the son of God. He's Lord of the flies. This is what Jesus said. Mark chapter 3, verse 28. I tell you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemy they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So why is that an unforgivable sin? Why is that an unpardonable sin? Well, you think about this for a minute. The way people get saved is the Holy Spirit draws them to God. The Holy Spirit is the one that testifies with our spirit that Jesus is the Son of God. So as long as somebody is calling the Spirit of God Beelzebub, there's no possible way for that person to be saved. That's why it's an unpardonable sin. And it is a sin of refusing to listen and resisting the Holy Spirit. We better be careful because we can resist to the point that we lose the capability of hearing an old evangelist, some of y'all may be familiar with. Uh, his name was J. Harold Smith. Y'all to Google him sometime, listen to some of the things he says. I don't agree with everything he says, but I do like to listen to him preach. He has a famous sermon called God's Three Deadlines. God's Three Deadlines. And in there, he talks about three deadlines. If you step over, uh, you're either going to lose your physical life or you're going to lose your soul. One of them is the unpardonable sin. And he told about preaching... Uh, somewhere in the south in a tent revival. And while he was preaching, the place was full, and J. Harold Smith said he was given the invitation. He was, he was pleading with people to turn their lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in the back, sitting on a motorcycle, was a man in a motorcycle jacket, and he had been listening to the whole sermon. And when they started giving the invitation, this, this man on this motorcycle looked at J. Harold Smith raised his voice above everybody in the crowd and said, to hell with the Holy Spirit. Fired up that motorcycle, did a donut, took off down the road, and the first intersection he came to, a semi killed him. I wasn't there, but I absolutely believe that to be the truth. There was a man, you say, did he commit the unpardonable sin? Absolutely. I'm not telling you that if you commit the unpardonable sin that God's going to kill you before this day's over. I'm not even telling you that anybody in here has ever committed the unpardonable sin. I wouldn't know it if you did. But all I do know is that it is a sin that will keep a person eternally damned if they commit it. And it's possible. And it is a sin of resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting the Holy Spirit causes us to drift farther and farther away from the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, for this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now picture, if you will, you're standing on a dock or a pier. So just pretend this is, a, this is a boat pier. And in front of me, there's a river flowing. Well, what I know is, what I know is, is I've been down the river. And I know just around the bend down there, just a little bit ways, there is a, there is a waterfall that's a half a mile long. And there is no boat that can go down that waterfall. And anybody in it will survive. I know that. And so I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, here come, a, here, here come some people that I loved, and, and, they're, and they're floating down this way. 
And, and I know what's going to happen. If they, if they drift past me, they're going to get in that current and they're going to be dead for sure. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to stand there and I'm going to shout. I'm going to say, turn back. I'm going to say, dive in. I'm going to say, catch this rope. I'm going to come up with any way I can to stop them from drifting past where I'm at. In that passage in Hebrews, he says that we need to give a more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. You know what he just said? In Hebrews 1, he said, God in the past spoke to us in many portions in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, we need to give a more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest we drift past them. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is, it's Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, standing on the pier, telling people, turn back, turn back, turn back. Don't go any farther because there's danger in the way. Now, what happens is we hear God telling us to change course. We hear God telling us time to make a correction. We hear God telling us what you're doing is not working. I can help you. I want to help you. But you've got to get out of that boat and come to the pier. That's, that's what you got to do. You can't do it. Well, nah, nah, he don't know what he's talking about. He's claiming that. I've seen other people come by here. We just come up with all kinds of reasons. And what we do is we begin to resist. We begin to ignore. The Holy Spirit calls us. The Holy Spirit admonishes us. The Holy Spirit's guiding us to the right place. And yet we turn away. Listen, if you're a Christian in here today and you're harboring and you're harboring some pet sin, and God has put his finger on that sin, and he's telling you to turn away, that's the Lord Jesus Christ yelling out to you to rescue you from sure danger that's down the stream. And if you don't, if you don't turn back, what's going to happen? You're going to just drift farther and farther and farther away. Christians, we need to surrender. We need to open up our Bibles. We need to pray. Listen, it's very possible through sin and spiritual indifference that a person drift past God's best for their life. And then, what is God's remedy? God's remedy for resisting the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. God's remedy is that we decide to stop resisting. <laughs> and so now what God has done is he's put the ball in our court. It's our play. It's up to us. I don't mean we do it on our strength, but what God is waiting for is a humble cry. What God is waiting for is a sincere surrender of our will to His Spirit. That's what God is wanting. I'm here to tell you something. When God sees that, when God sees that the prodigal has come to his senses, I'm here to tell you, God will move heaven and earth to rescue that saint. God's remedy is that we stop resisting and submit. Stephen offers his listeners the opportunity to repent and turn to Christ. Isaiah says in Isaiah 44, 45, verse 22, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. He will have compassion on him and our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God doesn't hold a grudge. It doesn't matter how long you've been resisting, don't matter how bad you've resisted. If you'll just... Stop resisting and surrender. God will fill you, empower you, and bless you. Years ago, I read about a little duck. Back years ago, before some of you kids even, you know, if you're under 50, you're a kid. But nonetheless, uh, I remember the day when, when, when you opened a can of RC Cola. Y'all do know what that is, right? All right. When you open it up and you, you, you pull the top back, you, you, you strip the thing all the way off. Y'all remember that? Now they stay attached. But back then, you pulled it off and there was a ring on there and it had a little tab. And we used to take and break the tabs off and that was our, that was our engagement rings and stuff. And so uh, we liked that. Well, the, the, the reason they stopped making those was, was several reasons. But one of the reasons was people would throw them in and wildlife. And they found this little duck. This, they found this duck 
who got one of those rings hung on his snout, on his beak. Does a, a duck have a beak or a snout? Anyway, it was on there. And, uh, you know, obviously this duck is never going to get this thing off. It's, it's there. And so he, he clawed himself and everything, and he's going to starve to death. This duck is going to starve to death. And so some environmentalists got real worried about this, and uh, they went out there and tried to lure him with feed. Surely he's hungry. He is way too smart for that. He didn't come nowhere near him. So they uh, come up, and, and, and they hired a, a scuba diver to get out in the lake, go under him, and get him by the legs. Much too fast for that. He wasn't about to get caught by no scuba diver. And so, so they got really ingenious, and somebody came up with this huge net with these rockets. And they got out there, and they were going to fire these rockets, arch them way up, and come back down, and surely he'd be in there. They named him. They named him Ringo. Well, Ringo was much too fast. He's too smart. He's too fast. He's too quick. He kept getting away. What that stupid duck did not understand, the one who was trying to catch him only wanted to set him free. You know, God wants to catch us so that he can set us free. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Surely we've got more sense than a duck. I'm not sure, huh? Okay, well, think about it. Here's the takeaway. This is a very simple message. It's always wise to submit to the Holy Spirit. And so we've got to give an invitation here this morning, and we ain't never done it like this before, so however you want to do it, it's all right with me. But I know that I know that I know. Listen, here's how I know. I don't ever remember wrestling about a sermon that I'm delivering and as much personal stuff I had to wade through to preach this message. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic. I'm just telling you that I had to deal with what God said in this text before I could bring it to you myself. There were some areas in my life where I was resisting. And I'm here to tell you, God nailed me. God nailed me. <laughs> I'm so glad he did. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, I can preach with freedom this morning. I'm preaching to you, a man who's been set free from bondage. I'm telling you this morning, some of y'all need to experience what I'm talking about this morning. You just need to come to Jesus and let him take the band off you and, and, and set you free. Because I know in a crowd this size, there are multiple people who are struggling with resisting the Holy Spirit. And so would you stand with me right now? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I know it's difficult to... to uh, to be still here. But just for a moment, I, I want you to think of something. Is God calling you to submit to the Holy Spirit and be saved this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed, you know whether or not you are saved. And if you're not saved this morning, would you like to be saved? Would you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Would you surrender is the Holy Spirit telling you, believe in the Lord Jesus, give Him your heart, give Him your life, surrender yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want to harm you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to ruin your life. He doesn't want to make you boring at parties. The Holy Spirit is just going to set you free. And so if you're not saved this morning, we're going to give an invitation right now in just a few moments. We'll begin to sing. And I want you to step right out. I want you to come to Jesus this morning. Come to Jesus. But there's Christians here this morning. And you're struggling with sin. And you know it. When I was talking about it, you were trying to ignore the Holy Spirit. You were trying to, you were trying to uh, act as if though I wasn't even talking to you. 
But you know it was. But it wasn't me. Don't do what they did. Don't attack the messenger because you don't like the message. Surrender. Surrender. Maybe God's calling you to sacrifice. Lay down something to His glory. Maybe God's just calling you back to Himself. You've strayed. The longer you stray, the more you're going to stray. Come back. Come home. I'm going to pray. And we've got aisles here this morning. Listen, if you want to come to the front and use this, whatever this thing is, you can. There's chairs up here. There's steps over there. You can kneel right where you're at. If you want to be, if you want to be saved, I want you to come forward, though, because I want to pray with you, and we've got deacons that want to get information and pray with you. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Will you not resist the Holy Spirit this morning? Will you say yes to whatever the Spirit of God is saying to you in your heart? Father, today I thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, how that you don't give up on us and you chase us down and you get us and you take the ring off of us because you love us. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to do the work of God. Father, I pray today in my feeble attempt try to preach the word of God that you'd save souls and change lives and draw us all closer to you that we'd not resist your spirit for it's in Jesus holy name I pray amen